7-8-2-3-7. Some 5 2 one, six. People are fleeing. There are more deaths in that zip code than in Iraq during the war. We're on the front line of the war. What are you doing out here tonight? I'm working, trying to get money to get my drugs. When was the last time you shot up? Yesterday in the morning. They got one foot in and one foot out, and they're about to go the wrong way. That's why you got to have people who remind those in this trap that it's not permanent. And that you have the ability to get out. Nothing is more powerful or credible than a witness. Redemption is being able to look at yourself, do some self-introspection, and say, where I go wrong at? I don't want to be that person anymore. I don't want to hurt people. I don't want to let people down. What led to that choice that made me go wrong? I thought a man was a hustler, a gangster, a man with kids by different women. That's what I thought a man was because I grew up without a father. And then you got to spend the rest of your life correcting. If I knew stuff I knew now back then, I'd want a whole different direction, man. There is a role people must play in their own uplift. If I have to come in here and tie shoestrings and water the plants, as long as I can get a paycheck, I'll yeah. do whatever it is I have to do. But I put a tank in the back of the van, a pressure washer, and went around and started washing cars in the community. Jasper's mobile car wash is taking off. And today I stand here, the largest minority food service company here in the city. We don't believe that folks can rise from the ashes. Life may have knocked you down. The judge said, you a menace to society when he sent us me. But these are Phoenix. You all are stories of hope. You can make a comeback from anything that's holding you down. And now the men are winning. They're getting victory in their lives because they feel like they're somebody. Hope keeps you going when you're out of. See, it's nothing like being hopeful that you can make it, man. That gives you the ability to go places that you never thought you could go. This life now with him, I can't even describe. I still believe that we have the capacity within our own nation to heal ourselves. But you have to have solutions that work. And the movement has to do with people. If you're going to fight a war, you better recruit soldiers. The hood heroes are the heroes. They are social enterprises led by grassroots organizations that are very close to the people who have need, which if supported and empowered, can help people who otherwise would be stuck in poverty. On the Women's Literacy Best Practice Workshop, welcome to the breakout room on gang violence and drug abuse prevention and intervention, the unique role of the family and community. I'm delighted and energized to see the participants from all over the globe in this session today. Namaste, my name is Sandhya Acharya, GPW leader from Nepal. I am executive director of the organization called Mahila Pahila, which means women first in Nepali. This organization works to empower urban poor women in Nepal through education and economic opportunities. And I am honored to be your facilitator for today. Looking and hearing about the work of our two amazing presenter, I am already excited to jump in the learning journey today, and I am sure all our audience are equally excited as well. I am looking forward to an inspiring, energizing, productive dialogue and long-term connection from today. So uh, before calling our first presenter, let's make some rule to have an active engagement in the chat box. Please focus on two symbols. A, capital A, it means uh, when we are welcoming our presenter, we write A, and C is for round of applause. So please feel free to have an active engagement in the chat box. Uh, so by writing A in the chat box, let's welcome our first presenter, Dr. Dayabu Saibu, Clinical Director at the Olista Recovery and Wellbeing Nigeria, Nigeria to tell us more about herself and the amazing work she is doing. Please write A and virtually welcome her to the program to introduce herself and about her inspiring work. Welcome, uh, Dr. Dean. Thank you, Sandhya. Thank you, everyone. Hello, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, my name is Dr. Ayaba Shaibu. I'm first of all a woman. I'm a wife, I'm a mother, and a peaceful woman. I'm a medical doctor working in the field of addiction and mental health. 
I'm the clinical director for Oliasa Recovery and Wellbeing, a mental health and drug rehabilitation treatment center. I'm the country director of Reconnect Health Development Initiative, a strictly mental health charity that seeks to promote awareness and knowledge on all aspects of mental health and preventing gender-based violence and strives to reduce stigma around mental health. I'm the Communications and Coordinating Secretary of Global Peace Women Nigeria. So I interface between the headquarters and Global Peace Women Nigeria. They have been working for several years in the field of addiction and drug abuse. And I'm happy to be here today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. B, for your introduction and giving us a glimpse about your influencing work. Definitely, we all are motivated for the cause you are working with, and we all have lots of queries. So for now, keeping all those queries on hold, we uh, move forward uh, to welcome our second presenter today. Now, I would like to invite Colette Papera, senior writer at Woodson Center USA, for her brief introduction and to tell us more about her inspiring work. I would like to give a floor to uh, uh, Colette. Please write A in the chat box, and let's welcome Ms. Colette. I, I have to say uh, I'm speaking humbly because uh, I'm mostly a scribe. I've mostly documented the work I'm talking about in 30 years working with the Woodson Center that exists to look and identify what's going on in low-income areas to address the most pressing problems, what locally based is happening, how it works, what the effect has been, and um, details on the people to see them up close. So, but in the process in those three decades, I've had the privilege to meet these people and sometimes be on site personally to see the miracles that are happening. And it's really changed and developed my heart. And so I'm speaking with that experience too. Uh, I'm, I'm speaking in particular about youth violence today, although the Woodson Center addresses many problems like uh, drug and alcohol addiction, prison re-entry. But uh, this is the one I'm focusing on today. In particular, as I said in my intro video, an initiative called the Violence Free Zone Initiative that was fully developed 20 years ago in one area of Southeast DC that was completely war-torn by youths who were fighting uh, gang wars. And the whole community was held hostage. And because of one group of concerned people, a group of men who knew the neighborhood and really committed themselves to address this crisis, they called themselves the Alliance of Concerned Men. The Woodson Center helped to inform them, equip them with what they needed. They went into this neighborhood and the transformation was miraculous. The Washington Post, uh, the capital's main newspaper, or one of the newspapers there, um, documented both before and after, and even those reporters could hardly believe the change. It uh, had been the bane of their neighborhood and held afraid to put a foot out of their door and let kids wait for school buses. They became ambassadors of peace doing landscaping together. <laughs> and once warring gang gangs bond together under the name of Concerned Brothers of Benning Terrace, the name of their development. And so um, change was miraculous and it was lifetime change recently at an event honoring the 40th anniversary of the Woodson Center one of the gang members came back. Now he's 40 something. He was 20 then, he was the leader of a gang. He married the leader of a girl gang. They have five kids and he's working productively um, for the Public Housing Authority in Louisiana. He's a supervisor there, so he spoke, but you see how sustainable these results are too. So I wanted to talk about that because especially here in the States, um, Youth violence has reached the epidemic portion. So many lives are being lost. So it's a very important uh, topic to deal with. And solutions are the most important thing to talk about. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Colette, for letting us know 
uh, about the work you are doing to prevent youth violence. And we are uh, really excited to listen more about the initiative Violence Free Zone. Uh, thank you so much for giving us a glimpse about the work you are doing. Uh, let, let's write C in the chat box and uh, give a round of applause to both our presenter for the introduction. Now it's time to call our reporter of the session, Aisa Ekabu. She's a GPW LA alumni from Nigeria. So now I want to give this floor to Aisa to introduce herself and her work. So let's write A in the chat box and welcome Miss Aisa. Aisa, the floor is yours. Um, say hello, everybody. Thank you. Um for making out time to be here. My name is Aisha Yakubu from Nigeria. I'm a GPWA alumni and a rapporteur for this breakout session. I run a business in Nigeria. It's a shared co-working space and I'm also um, passionate about community development. I work around um, education in um, low-income communities and child protection. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Aisa, for your introduction and aspiration of being a leader to your community. Now, we enter to our second session of question and answer. Before we uh, go to the questions that were submitted by our uh, participants during registration, yeah, I would like to request our attentive audience to put their queries in the chat box for our respective speakers. We would love to hear get from you. Now, moving ahead, my first question goes to uh, Dr. D. Uh, Dr. D, you have been working uh, with youth on prevention of drug abuse for such a long time. Can you tell us, can you share with us the top two lessons that you have learned and uh, you would implement it every time? Dr. D. Okay, thank you very much, um, colleagues. I think over the years, what I have realized is um, drug abuse and addiction, um, the first thing is, um, it's a family disease, right? So one person uses the substances, but the entire family is affected in one way or the other. So when you're working to rehabilitate or to treat someone who is struggling with drug abuse or addiction, you have to, you're practically treating the entire family because the dynamics from one family is different from the dynamics in another family. So you don't focus on just the individual, but you focus on the family as well, because every member of the family assumes subconsciously a sort of role that they don't realize. You know, so you tend to have someone who unknowingly or knowingly becomes the enabler. So they sympathize with this person, either by helping them or making it easy for them to get those substances. You find the one that becomes a superhero who tries to compensate, you know, by being an overachiever to reduce the pain the family is feeling. You have the one that becomes the mascot that tries to be the clown or the funny person, you know, in the family just to try and reduce the pain and the sadness caused by the addiction of the other family member. Then you have the lost child or the silent child. This one just withdraws into their shell and does not talk about anything that has to do with the addiction, just does not want to relate with it. So what I'm trying to say is addiction is a family disease, so it affects the entire family, not just that person. Second thing I've noticed is it's usually detected late because of um, the insufficient awareness. And this is why I think you know, family cohesion comes into play because there are usually telltale signs that we fail to notice early, either change in behavior or change in routine or um, the paraphernalia of using drugs. So it's either the person is keeping the stems or the spoons or the lighters, you know, or the cans or bottles of alcohol, depending on the substance of use. So the stronger the family units, the more likely we are to notice the early signs you know, of drug abuse and addiction. And the earlier we're able to intervene and the better the outcome in treatment. So these are the top two things I would like to talk about you know, for this session. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. D. 
uh, for your uh, aspiration ward and uh, yes, the family, it's a drug addiction is addiction is a family disease and it, in, it affects the entire family. And we'd love to know uh, about the different strategy that you take to uh, deal with this particular issue. Where we are really looking forward for it. Uh, uh, now, my uh, first question goes to Khalid. Uh, Khalid, like you have been writing, developing, and monitoring the strategy used for the violence prevention for more than three decades now. It's a long time. Uh, can you please share us the main lessons that you have learned from your experiences? Khalid, yeah. Again, um, going to the model of the violence free zone. Uh, where these men from the community went in and night after night stayed by these kids until they found it. At first, there wasn't trust. They thought, are these police or what? You know, uh, But eventually they really felt their heart and they saw their commitment and they began to respond. Uh, and then the turnaround started. And when it did, um, this is just a recap, uh, the Alliance of Concerned Men went to the Woodson Center and asked Bob for advice. And he had years of experience before that visiting places where miracles had happened in uh, gang intervention too, sometimes by a lone person. <laughs> so he shared what, what their model was. And from these models, I would say things are, is uh, first of all, the solutions exist within the community and they're unique there. They're, created by people who are heartfelt. They know the problems firsthand. Some of them went through the same problems they're addressing now. So they have this passion and they're available 24 hours a day, seven days a week for these, for whoever they're reaching out to. So the community has um, the examples. Sometimes they're just little nascent efforts, but if you identify them and try to strengthen those, that's where the trust is, that's where the response is, and that's where the results can be. So look to the neighborhood suffering the problems. Second in all of these, the key ingredient was personal outreach, heartfelt commitment, personal long-term outreach by another human being, a man or a woman, in this case, mostly men, or and, and the boys, the, the youths they have changed also reach out as mentors to their peers who are involved in violence. They have authority, they have knowledge um, of a higher, you know, of uh, where the influence is. And so they have the power, the people. Um, so that heartfelt personal long-term commitment is the second key ingredient. And the third, in this violence-free zone, once the kids started to turn around and actually united as a joint, group, the Concerned Brothers, uh, they needed a place to channel that positive energy. They needed opportunities, whether it be academic, employment, but for productive activity. And in this case, in Washington, D.C., Bob Woodson linked the Alliance of Concerned Men with a public housing director, and he gave jobs of landscaping and graffiti removal to these kids and also um, to the police, the commander in that district was Rodney Monroe. He's still active in similar activities aligned and affiliated with the uh, Woodson Center, but he's a renowned police chief uh, in uh, several cities throughout the nation. So you need to provide those opportunities. That's the three key things. Thank you, Khalid, for your brief and inspiring learning from three decades of experience. Solution exists within neighborhood, engage the community, personal and consistent outreach and opportunities to channelize the changes can be the best strategy sometimes to solve any social problems in the community. Thank you. Uh, even here in Nepal, uh, we localize the Peace Begins in Home campaign. Uh, and engage like you know housewife community level organization youth group women group uh, uh, to spread the message and now even we are like no more working with that particular community but they have already emphasized the 
uh, empathize the uh, meaning of peace begins at home and they still spread the message uh, and I'm sure our audience are, uh, can also relate to it as well. Thank you so much for, it, for highlighting those three beautiful points. Uh, now I would like to move to Dr. D uh, for the next questions. Uh, Dr. D, uh, like, you know, uh, as you said that addiction, uh, addiction, you have to treat the whole family uh, in case of addiction and uh, in the society, like, you know, family, friends and general public uh, can sometimes carry negative feelings about drug use or behavior. Can you tell us more about the stigma perceived for the drug abuse uh, in this particular issue, Dr. D? Thank you very much, Sandhya. Yes, um, stigma as, as it relates to addiction is very, you know, central to the work we do because, you know, there are, very, there are so many perceptions that come with drug abuse and addiction. So it's perceived as moral failure, it's perceived as a character flaw, you know, it's perceived as a self-inflicted condition. So people still have difficulty, you know, seeing it as a chronic brain disease. But, you know, um, whether we accept it or not, addiction is a chronic relapsing brain disease, right? There's hardly, I'm yet to see one person who stands up one day and says to themselves, my ambition is, be, is to become a drug addict. No one sets out from the beginning to become a drug addict. So the first time people use, there's always a reason that makes them use. Be it experimentation, be it peer pressure, be it frustration, it could be sleep problems, it could be some form of chronic pain, which usually starts at acute pain. And then over the years, it, over time, it changes. The reason for use changes over time. So from you know, experimental or occasional, it becomes habitual, then it becomes compulsive use. But at the point when addiction sets in, it has gone beyond the control of the individual. So at that point, it is a disease, right? So the more people understand that this is what it is, the less where we are, you know, the less likely we are to keep telling people, just stop it. Can't you see that it's affecting your health? Can't you see that it's affecting your occupation? Can't you see that it's breaking your, the heart of your loved ones? They see it, they are powerless over it, right? So. We have to do a lot of awareness, a lot of education for people to understand, you know, that this is what it is at that time. And there's a strong probability for relapse. We know that it will test your emotions, it will test your patience, but it is what it is. It is a chronic relapsing brain disease. So you have to do a lot of work. It will consume a lot of resources. You know, so that's a fundamental thing that we need people to know because it will reduce the stigma. When you see it less as something that someone can just stop and more of something that requires time to treat and manage, you know, the more likely we are. Just the same way you can't cure diabetes or hypertension, there's a chronic disease, it's the same way you treat addiction, it's chronic. In a lot of cases, lifelong. Yeah, so the underscore, the underlying factor is education, awareness, and advocacy. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. D, for letting us know about the stigma attached to drug use and the uh, need of awareness and education to reduce the stigma. Uh, I would also like uh, to add one more question to Dr. D with this. Like, you know, what are the ways to contribute for a more accepting society uh, in this uh, particular issue, you mentioned about awareness and education. What are the ways of educating them? Are uh, like, is there any uh, model? For example, I heard somewhere uh, uh, about the bottom-up process, like you know, the language choices in day-to-day -day conversation. Uh, are there any other ways uh, to contribute for more accepting society in the uh, particular issue of drug abuse and? Uh, and the issue of uh, uh, people to accept the um, uh, feelings about the uh, issues, Dr. D? 
Okay, yes. Yeah. So what uh, so one of the things we advocate for and we preach are terms that we tell people not to use. You know, so there are terms that we call the stigmatizing words. We tell people not to use those terms. So don't call, don't say someone is an addict, for example, because it, it serves as a label. So you've attached a label to that human being. So we see them more as persons living with a substance use disorder. So you have to try to preserve human dignity. So the person is a human being first that has a condition. So they are persons living with a substance use disorder. So the same way if they do their drug toxicology, you know, and you say, okay, can you give me a urine sample? And they say, okay, your urine is clean. We usually discourage that as well. Because what you're saying is if there's a substance in it, it means the urine is dirty, right? Mm -hmm. So we prefer to say the urine tested positive for X, Y, Z, because if someone right, immunologists, generally, because so those are the things I social media awareness, you know, person to person live conversations, and you know, normalizing those conversations around drug addiction. We try to tell people to talk about it rather than sweep it under the carpet and hide from it. So those are some of the strategies. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. D, for letting us know about the strategy and uh, small behavior that has uh, it, that has a big impact uh, yeah, on that has a big impact on building uh, the uh, stigma and uh, some of our small behavior can help to reduce those stigma. Thank you so much, Dr. D, for highlighting those points. Now, I would like uh, before I go to uh, call it. I would request our participants to please uh, write uh, write uh, the question in the chat box. If you have any questions for our presenter, if you have any queries regarding uh, this piece or the strategy that they are uh, talking about, please do write about the, uh, please do ask the questions and please do drop it in the chat box. Thank you. Uh, now I would like to move uh, to call it. Uh, so, um, uh, so uh, like call it like, you know, uh, uh, what is like one piece of advice that you uh, find yourself giving to the individual or group of people who are working in the similar issue? Like, you know, if they come to you and ask you like, what piece of advice would you like to give us uh, uh, reviewing your 30 years uh, experience, what would we get, call it? Well, <laughs> I say sometimes that Bob Woodson sort of took over my mind. I do think uh, like a lot, I respond to situations like he did. And this is both for youth violence, but for anything, any uh, deficiency or a problem in a neighborhood to first approach it with a solution orientation. Uh, he often says, you know, sometimes people enter low-income communities, whether they're urban or rural, with the notebooks to tally the deficiencies. He calls them failure studies. How many kids are dropping out of school? How many people are addicted? And he, he flips those statistics around. He said, if 70% of the kids are in fatherless homes, that means 30% aren't. So what did they do that was right? How did that happen for those 30%? Or if 60% are dropping out of schools. How did that 40% hang in there? What were the key elements? So go in with a solution in mind. And uh, I would say that uh, is number one and uh, see what's working and try to see how you can boost it. So there's a role for um, philanthropy. There's even a role for government, but it should be on tap, not on top. They should be supportive and not directive. They should see how to facilitate and what they could do to expand and augment the efforts that are going on. And, uh, and there's a personal message to this too, uh, in terms of attitude toward life. Um, 
there's a quote that directs us all in the Woodson Center, and it's uh, Chuck Charles Swindle had said, 10% of your life is determined by what happens to you. 90% is determined by your response to what happens to you. And uh, that's an empowering mindset. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you, thank you, Colin. Um, I, my takeaway point here is to focus on positive side, to focus on what's working rather than what's not working. Dear audience, if you have any takeaway point, please feel free to write it in the chat box. And I really uh, can, I really can relate with the quote, uh, get call it mentioned that 10% of uh, our life is determined by what happens to us and 90% is how we react to the situation. Thank you so much, Colin, for bringing out this wonderful uh, question. Uh, now I would like to uh, go to uh, Dr. D uh, with the same question, like, you know, the. Uh, can you share one of the most inspiring moments or, or people that you have made through your work? Any changes that you have witnessed that has like that you would like to share with us today, Dr. D? Okay, thank you. I think the moment in my job or in the line of this work that has you know stood out for me to date is someone who is in recovery who had given up. You know, after the first rehabilitation, the person relapses, the person comes back again. The second time, the person relapses, the person comes back a third time, relapses and says, this is the last time. Because after this, my family is not going to pay. You know, they can't afford treatment. But I really want to do this. I don't know what it is. I stand in my way, but I'm motivated more than ever you know, and treatment was given at no cost at that time. And he's seven years in recovery today. He's seven years sober. And he is the one who brings people, his friends, in for treatment. And he serves as a voice, you know, for people in recovery. Because a lot of times, as, so, as professionals, it's easy for the person who is in recovery to say, you've never been addicted to anything. So you don't understand. But if they hear from someone who has done it before, it has a stronger impact. So till date, you know, that stands out for me because he says, you know, we didn't give up on him, right? If we had given up on him, he wouldn't have had that chance. And that was the chance that turned everything around. So the point is, you know, we never give up on everyone. As long as they are alive, there's always hope there's always a chance that the person would do well. To believe in the strengths that the people have, no matter how little it is. Okay, so that's the point that sticks out. Thank you, Dr. D. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your experience with us. Uh, I would like to, uh, I would like to give the same question to Colette. Like, can you say to us uh, one of the most inspiring moment of people that you that you have made through your work, Colette? Yes. Well, <laughs> I stayed with um, the Woodson Center for as long as I did, not as a career, <laughs> but because. <laughs> So nourishing, personally, and inspiring. So every day, every group I've seen, every, everybody that Bob's touched and Bob himself, he's now 84, he's going full steam ahead. He's got continually new visions and he's going with new power and new connections and new ideas. So he's my inspiration, but also, Though every day is an inspiration for me, most recently I wanted to go back to that uh, celebration of two of the most recent examples that have inspired me. And one is at that event celebrating the 40th anniversary where the young gang member came back now in his 40s and just gave a tribute and told how his life had changed. And then Bob got up and hugged him and told his own personal story about what he received from those former gang members. And this is long ago, just after the violence free zone, Bob had a son named Rob, Robert the third actually, and, uh, or the second, who was, he was his heir apparent. He uh, had done a lot with different political figures in service to different 
politics, so he understood politics and policy, and he had a deepest heart for these people. And then after we had a family gathering uh, around Christmas time one year, he went out with his younger brother to get something. The car hit black ice where you have no control and flipped over and he was killed instantly. And that was the darkest period of Bob's life to have lost that son. He said he had, he just did not have the will to go on. And he, at, at his son's memorial service, Bob was just trying to stand up and the door opened <laughs> and these kids all came around and surrounded and hugged him. And uh, so you see what he received from what he gave. He said that was a changing point. He got new courage. He knew why he was doing what he was doing. Very deep. <laughs> and then the other thing is a new project of the Woodson Center. It's called the Concerned Black Mothers United. It just started within the last two years and already it's expanded to hundreds and hundreds of mothers who are members. There are 10 different districts in the organization with 10 lead moms and every single person affiliated with this United Black Mothers, Voices of Black Mothers United, uh, has lost a child to street violence or homicides. Uh, the executive director herself had a bright, brilliant 16-year-old daughter that was with a friend on her way um, to meet with other friends one night and they stopped to get gas and two cars pulled up and got involved in the shootout and those two girls were killed during that. She's the executive director of this group. And the group is just so inspirational to me because I can't imagine that pain. It's like the biggest grief you could imagine suffering and their first response is to reach out to counterparts. And as they do that, they keep tapping more and more pockets. When they meet one another person, they'll find out that person herself has already reached out you know, to other people. So that's how the network uh, forms so quickly, but it's that, um, impetus to heal through healing others and to receive through giving. And um, they also work in the States in reaction to uh, some high profile events. There've been calls to defund the police and these women also speaking from experience and moral authority have created initiatives to work with the police to create safe neighborhoods and sometimes it involves giving recommendations for reform of policing techniques or relationship to the community. But through that, um, that effort to provide safe communities, a lot of good is already happening. And uh, when there is a communication between law enforcement and the community in the states before then, people never spoke to the police. So the vast majority of these tragic homicides are open cases. They never identified a killer. And at least for the mom's hearts, there's closure. Uh, now working with the police, they are able to be a conduit for information. And a lot of these cases were brought to closure. And that doesn't mean like a self-righteous demand for justice only. Like one, one of these mothers, when she found out who the killer was and when he was convicted, she visits him in jail. They even work together on a screenplay for a video. So uh, that's an example of what Bob calls radical grace, forgiveness uh, in the spot. And, and, and that radical grace and forgiveness is redemptive. It conquers your enemy, not by defeating him, but by changing him to a friend. So I'd like to say that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. D. Thank you, Colin, for sharing your experience. I'm sure your experience made all of us emotional and inspired at the same time. Uh, when the initiation, like when it gets starts by an individual with self-motivation, then there is no way to stop. And uh, your experience uh, kind of proved it. It took my heart to hear how mothers who lost their children, their near ones came together and turned their anger, their hate into powerful weapon to establish peace. It's really amazing. Thank you for sharing such an experience. Thank you so much. 
uh, moving forward, uh, we have a question from the uh, from uh, Hova from Boston to Dr. D. Uh, so her question uh, goes this way: Are you working with local communities or or any other family members to address the root cause, Dr. D? Okay, thank you, thank you, Hawa. Yes, yeah, so at Nova Peace Women Nigeria, that's our focus. Because, you know, when we say peace begins in the home, you know, we recognize the family unit and the home as the focal point of anything you want to achieve in the society, right? So from the video presentation, I don't know if, you know, you were on at that time. I talked about a program we did in the heart of the northern part of Nigeria. In that program, we had school teachers, we had mothers, we had religious leaders, we had heads of traditional institutions, we had individuals working in civil society organizations. You know, it was a huge, huge program where we all sat down to itemize the different aspects that we could work on, you know, in terms of addressing the root causes, you know, of substance use. So is it the family unit? Is it parenting styles that have changed? Is it um, that in schools, we have to talk more about these things? Is it that we have to use the CSOs, the civil society organizations to go to the streets, you know, and educate people that these things are, you know, this thing is real. Yeah, so we're working with local communities, heads of, you know, district heads of communities, you know, to make them, first of all, understand what is addiction such that we disabuse the stereotype that once someone has an addiction problem, you just condemn them to either a home or you punish them or you, you, know, you incarcerate them. So when you start with that and people understand, then they can cascade it down. You know? So we need people to understand that as a mother, as a parent, you need to always know what's going on with your child. Yeah, so that's what we're doing with the different sectors, the different stakeholders. And in our, own, in our own programs, we're looking at, apart from the social media sensitizations, we're looking at pockets of programs that we're going to do with families to enhance bonding. Because with the way the world is, you know, parents, mothers are getting busier and they're getting less intentional about their parenting, about you know, the relationship with their children. So we're trying to strengthen that by organizing little events, you know, where you have mothers either come out for picnics with their children, where you do a do you know your child kind of games, you know, to enhance the relationship between mothers and children, such that a mother is able to stand up one day and say, this is very unlike you, you've been sleeping all day. Can you come with me or can I take a peek, you know, and do a test? And the child doesn't feel offended because he's already developed that relationship with his mom or with her mom. Yes, so to answer your question, you know, we're working with communities and families, you know, to address what these things are. There are some things that are beyond the communities and the family that we need to involve the government, you know, in terms of like drug supply reduction, so we're also working with the drug agency, you know, um, shortly after this program, we're looking at, you know, having a meeting with the head of the drug agency in Nigeria to also see how we can, you know, work with them in terms of the drug supply reduction. Yeah, so that's what we do or we're doing at the moment. Thank I you. hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. D, for saying us about the family community based approach to address uh, drug abuse problem. And uh, we can relate it when we tell, uh, when we are, are campaigning at Peace Begins at Home, we are saying that family is the institution where the bond helps us to uh, like solve any kind of problem. It starts within the family and then we slowly go to community. and. Uh, the example that you gave that when we create one sort of bond with the family, we'll uh, realize uh, if there is any unusual thing going on and it prevents lots of other social issues, including drug abuse. Thank you, Dr. D, for your initiation. Uh, my uh, next question is for Colette again. We have a question for you. 
Uh, you already mentioned about the strategy and the model that uh, we have initiated and also mentioned that the similar model is used in other five states of USA. That's, that's really amazing. Uh, do you think that this similar model can be applied to other nations, other cities with different culture, uh, you know, with different uh, uh, societal aspect and variety of uh, culture? I want to ask, like, uh, is it scalable? And if yes, like what would you suggest to the uh, people who look forward to take this model to their country, their community? Right. Well, I would say it's definitely um, uh, transportable or adaptable in different cultures, different places, because at its essence, it's about the heart and that's the same regardless of where you live or what you wear or what language you speak um, with young people probably all generations but young people are suffering here in the states acutely um, a lack of purpose in their lives and meaning and vision and that crosses all economic and ethnic and geographic barriers that that need so even to suburban kids say, those are different cultures, urban and suburban, right after the violence free zone uh, was created. And, and those kinds of outreach were done long before by individuals, but when it was consolidated into a program and a model, um, we had a conference with 30 kids or more than 30 from the urban area and from the suburban area. And this is, a lot of the kids came from the areas of like Columbine, where there was a mass shooting, a uh, school shooting, someone came in and killed a lot of students in one, just less than an hour one day. And um, they talked together. And uh, after that conference where they shared and cried and laughed <laughs> across all kinds of boundaries, uh, one girl from Columbine said, you know, we're all in this together. We're suffering the same things. And our, the way is the same for us. The only difference is the grass between our yards is bigger in our neighborhoods. And um, so I wanted to share that that is exportable, definitely. And uh, other countries, you'd have to use that same model. You'd have to go to the country, you know, um, and, uh, you know, like, see what Dr. D is doing, see what's happening on the grassroots levels and try to boost it and strengthen it. And when you talk about scalability, yes, that's the whole goal that a 40 year goal of the Woodson Center is to bring recognition and resources. So the scalable part, again, are the people who can support what's going on, not direct, but who can give whatever they have uh, to support and they should have big minds of how they can do that you know Bob tells a story of once how he saw um, a CEO of a country that felt he wanted to give in some way and he was in a, a soup kitchen dishing out soup to the homeless and Bob said put that ladle down you've got more to give and so when people have technical expertise to help these groups too to structure and support what they're doing. They can offer, offer the best of what you have. So that's what I would say. Yeah. Thank you, Colette. Uh, definitely with a brief research, when we start with community-based approach, understand the capacity, uh, as you said, explore the resources within community and connect them with our issues uh, from heart, then our model will become more sustainable. And thank you for letting us know about it. Uh, I'm sure that everyone can relate when I say that this conversation is getting so intense and wonderful and we are going ahead of time. I would like to request our amazing audience to grant a couple of extra few minutes here. If you are getting late, uh, please uh, let us know. But uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, now we have a last question that's uh, for uh, Dr. D. Uh, that's from... Uh, Lillian Debo, uh, she is a CEO of Lillian Debo Foundation for Women and Girls with Disabilities in uh, Cameroon. Uh, so her question is like, how can one motivate teenager with disability who is addicted to drugs and who does not listen to any advice from the family? Dr. D. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lillian. Lillian, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so... Um, 
there are many things, right? So it'd be difficult to say what, how, you know, what exactly someone will do because you don't have the full picture. So you need to know more about this individual, correct? Will the person be frustrated and angry because of their disability? Are there other things in the family, the family dynamic that pushed the person in the first place to start using substances? Was the, is the person using substances to cope with an emotion? Because the thing is substances have, a strong, uh, have an interesting relationship with our mental health. For some people, they use those drugs to escape some mental health conditions such as anxiety or depression or hearing voices. So I don't know what sort of disability this child has. So could the person have been struggling with depression and say using some medications to lift the mood and the person got dependent on it? Or are the drugs the reason this individual is becoming more difficult to work with? How much of the addiction does family know or understand? And how are they talking to this individual about it? Because the natural response to addiction by family is that they get frustrated. So they keep blaming this individual. Can't you see what you're doing? Can't you see what you're causing to the family? Can't you just stop it, right? So the, the individual feels judged and the person keeps acting out. So what we see from the outside is this person is not listening to advice. But again, what advice are we giving this individual? We're telling the person, just stop. Can't you see what you're doing? Just stop. The person is unable to just stop because the person has something else that has taken over the function of the brain. Logical reasoning, decision-making, good judgment has been taken over by a psychoactive substance. So first of all, the person needs to be addressed in a non-judgmental way. So you need to be a good listener, first of all. Tell me your story. Why do you think, so if they bring the, such an individual to me, first of all, you have to try to understand the person. Hello, Mr. XYZ, or hello, Ms. XYZ, how are you? So what's your story? And I just want you to know that I'm not speaking to you from a place of perfection. I also have my shortcomings, but let's just see how we can go on this journey together and see how we can together find a solution. I don't have all the solutions. So you've made yourself, you know, seen as a mortal who has flaws as well. So you're not the perfect person who is here to judge the individual. And you find out that, you know, a lot of parents will come and say, doctor, what did you just do with my child? You know, why is the, this person able to say, um, Dr. D, I just messed up. You know, I've been doing well, but I just took a bottle of alcohol. And I said, and I say, come around and let's talk about it. Because you've given them, you're not encouraging them to use, but you're giving them the permission to see themselves as imperfect. So it's a lot of things, okay? So, you know, because we tend to always advise. I'm not using it, does not make me a better person than that person. So listen, how do I think, you know, how do you think we can, you know, do this? What are your triggers? What are the things that keep pushing you to use it? So motivational enhancement is important. Let them know that they have strengths and you're going to use their strengths to fight their weaknesses. So that's very important. So the, it takes a lot of coaching. It takes a lot of skill. It takes a lot of patience because sometimes even as professionals, you have to separate your emotions from this thing. You might be doing so well and then your client comes back one day and they're all messed up, excuse me, French. And then you're like, oh my goodness. But okay, you know, let's move on because they are, they are speed bumps, isn't it? They don't stop us. They might slow us down, but they don't necessarily stop us in the journey of life. Yeah, so it's a lot of things. I hope this helps, Lilia. Thank you, Dr. B. Thank you. Motivational enhancement is one of the uh, highlighted point when you are dealing with uh, people. Uh, 
and lots of patience. Um, thank you, Dr. D. I'm sure that we, all our participants are equally motivated as I am. There are a few questions uh, because of uh, we are running out of time. Uh, there is a question from Bize. I would uh, request the speakers to address that particular question uh, during the closing remarks. So we all are equally motivated as I am, and uh, we all want this conversation to go on. Uh, and if anyone has uh, missed the bullet point here, we have our wonderful repertoire to give a quick review and highlight the three takeaway point. Uh, so thanking our both the presenter, I would like to hand over uh, it to Aisa. Aisa, uh, here you go for the three bullet takeaway point and a quick review of the session. All over to Aisa. Okay, thank you very much, um, Sandia, and thank you to Dr. D and Colette for that wonderful presentation. So I'll just hi, um, go over um, what both um, presenters have um, spoken to us about and the key lessons, some of the, most of the key lessons we have learned. I'm sure we've learned a lot, so this is just a summary. Um, Dr. I'll start with Dr. D. As we know, as she has introduced herself, she's a clinical director at the Oliester Center. So we sought to know what lessons she has learned. She shared the lessons she has learned um, through her journey as an addiction and mental health expert. Um, well, the key thing is um, families actually play a very key role towards the rehabilitation of, the, of someone who's suffering from um, Dr. D. Correct me, I don't want to say addiction. I've learned something new now. Someone who is um, who has falling into a drug problem. Addiction. Okay, addiction. Addiction or, is a disease. Yeah, it's okay. okay. So addiction. Um, we're made to first of all see addiction as a disease, and uh, people need help with that. The family comes together because it affects families in different ways, and families have to come together to support and help um, rehabilitate. Um, the and the the person suffering from this addiction this is the role the the moral support they give in in addition to the um, clinical and health um, uh, interventions the person um, receives and then she actually addressed the issue of stigmatization which we need um, as a people we need a lot of sens sensitization and education against stigmatizing people with addiction and see it as a chronic brain disease instead of a self-afflicted or a moral decadence kind of thing that we um, usually stigmatize people and make it very hard for them to speak about it or to seek help about it. So these are um, the key takeaways. So we, um, and then she shared her inspiring moment. She shared a story of, um, a, page, uh, a, per, a person who's, um, who was unrelenting in getting rehabilitated. He had a number of relapses, but he was still hopeful and motivated. And he showed tenacity and persistence that he wanted to get well and wanted to do everything possible to get well. Well, the mental health experts did not give up on him. And here he is seven years on, um, recovering and being an ambassador to help people out of addiction. So these are the key takeaways from Dr. D. And then for Colette, who's a, a senior writer at, at the Woodson Center, she's spent uh, 30 plus years documenting um, interventions against interventions of drug abuse and gang violence and the successes um, that have been recorded. She shared the, the model of the Woodson Center, which has worked very well and all, has also produced the violence-free zone intervention that has taken a lot of people out of gang um, and drug abuse. This um, model has three approach that uh, it believes the solutions exist within the communities and there's a personal and sincere heartfelt outreach. Once people um, start turning around and reforming. They need to be engaged productively, given jobs so that so to sustain their reformation. And um, her advice would be that when we approach 
problems, we should approach them with a solution-driven intervention. We should approach them. That is pretty much with optimism that, yes, we're going to get a solution from there. We should look at and miss the problems, what is working, and how do we boost what is working to resolve the issues on ground. And she also shared their um, quote, their famous quote at the Woodson Center by Charles Sweden that says 10% of what happens to you, uh, 10% is what happens to you and 90% is how you react to what happens to you. So her inspiring moment, she shared a story of Bob Woodson uh, while he was grieving after the loss of his son. Um, and um, he had the people from the, he had, he had uh, worked with and helped rehabilitate come to share the moment of grief with him. That really strengthened him a lot. And he saw that what he gave, he actually received. The love he gave, he received in his time of need. And also the Voices of Black Mothers United, which really personally has a piece of my heart with it. Um, this is, uh, these are a group of mothers who are channeling their grief productively, who are giving back to their community and forming strong support networks to help other mothers who are grieving and who have passed, who are passing through the moments they have passed through, and also generally to help solve the problem of gang and drug abuse in their society. So these are the key takeaways among a lot of things and a lot of knowledge our speakers have shared with us. Thank you, Sandia. Thank you, thank you, Aisa. So 10% of what happens, 10% is what happens to you and 90% is how you react what happens to you. It's my takeaway point. What is yours to say to us in the chat box? So uh, before going to the conclusion remarks from our presenter, I request all the participants to get ready for the group picture by setting up virtual background as your national flag, if possible. So after the uh, concluding remarks from our presenter, we will take a group photo. Uh, now I would uh, uh, I, now I would request uh, Dr. D to give her closing remarks addressing the question by Bizet. So his question was: Do you think the main cause of drug use and violence among the youth is to do with the unemployment status? It is for the both the speaker. Uh, I think a lot of humanitarian activities are focused on curative nature of work, which are primarily managing the youth problem. What would be the preventive nature of work civil society organization could do to prevent violence and drug use among youth? So the, the floor is your Dr. D. A closing remarks addressing the question of Bizet. Thank you. Thank you, Uh, Dr. D, I think call it. Uh, you can go with the closing. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Okay. That's okay. Yeah. So um, it's a lot of things, right? We um, the cost of drug abuse is multifactorial. So if we say we're going to focus on unemployment, there are people who are employed that also struggle with addiction, right? So it's. managing those individuals. We try to keep them occupied. We try to key into their goals. Can someone hear me? Everyone seems frozen. Yes, 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 Dr. Okay, D. good, yeah, okay, okay, good. So just key into the individual goals. So it's not a one size fits all, right? So some, some people start their addiction after they are employed. So on, uh, getting them a job is not one of the things that will solve the problem of the addiction. So it's all about outlining the person's goals, um, the strengths and the weaknesses and the resources the individual has, you know, that will help the recovery journey. So if the person is out of school, does the person want to get a degree? So you incorporate that in their recovery journey and in their treatment plan, right? And I agree that a lot of times we tend to focus on treatment. And the focus of this, which peace begins in the home, is to prevent. Because the number of people who are struggling with addiction right now, if we spend the next 50 years trying to rehabilitate them, you know, no one can say how much success you're going to achieve. 
So I, I think we should focus a lot more on preventing more people from joining that wagon of addiction as much as we can. So I agree with you that, yes, we should pull our strength on prevention while we're trying to rehabilitate and treat the people who are already, you know, uh, struggling with this addiction problem. So there are a lot of things, awareness, education, um, employment, you know, and a host of other things. Yeah, so that's all I would say. I don't know if Colette has anything to add. Thank, thank you, Doctor D. Uh, I would like uh, to uh, I would like to give the floor to Khalid to uh, give her closing remarks, addressing the question in very short time as we are running out of time. Khalid, over to you. Okay, uh, <laughs> I did give my three points that I learned. This will be very short, but uh, one point that I mentioned I don't know if it uh, was really highlighted, but that. In essence, the problem is a moral and spiritual freefall that's affecting not only kids, but say our youth today. And it, it's expressed in different ways in different um, cultures within the states. And, uh, and uh, that lack of meaning, that lack of value, lack of value of life results in homicides in some urban areas. In, uh, say, low-income rural areas, it results in opioid addiction and deaths from overdoses. And uh, in suburban areas, the, one of the highest income areas, say, Silicon Valley, uh, the high-tech area of California, parents are doing a brigade. They change watches over a bridge because so many of their young people have been hurling themselves to their deaths and suicides off that bridge. So the answer to all of them essentially is a deep internal um, answer. And the solution is through the kind of outreach I described in this one example too. And it has hope for America, it has hope beyond all boundaries. Just like to say that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, both our motivating presenter. Thank you so much. So uh, thank you all our participants, presenter, rapporteur, backstage technical supporter for making this workshop possible and creating meaningful engagement. As I said in the beginning, this is just the start of our connection. Please feel free to get connected with us and let us work together to make this world a better place. Thank you for your participation and let's stay connected. Now it's time to hear the closing remarks from our Global Peace Women President, Dr. Sunuk Kang. So let's uh, write C in the chat box and welcome her uh, virtually to give her closing remarks. And thank you everyone for you, such a meaningful participants. It means a lot and thank you for being here and giving your valuable feedback. Thank you both the presenter, rapporteur for making this program successful. Thank you so much. Amazing, right? Some of these issues are so complex. It is easy to get overwhelmed. However, each presenter, each facilitator, repertoire, and discussant embodies the power of a service-minded woman, motivated by her love for her family and other families, our shared human family, to make the world a better place. I know many of you have poured years, if not decades, into public service for your communities and nations. You are on inspiration. I'd like to revisit the question that GP Women Chairwoman, Dr. Chun Sung Moon posed to us all yesterday. How can we as a woman, as a readers, contribute to opening a path to a brighter future? Through the plenary yesterday and the work workshop today, I think that we have realized the answer begins in our families and extends out into our communities and to the world. In our homes, we can cultivate profound reserves of gratitude, service, and unconditional love that can spread out and generate effective and sustainable solutions. If each of us continues to take action in our homes and in our communities. If 
each of us continues to invest in the connections we made here, I truly believe that we will spark transformation toward a more peaceful world, right? Dr. Moon said, together with our collective strength of service, heart, and care, we will get through these times and we will create a brighter and greater future. I truly firmly believe this. So instead of closing the story, let this be a new chapter of the exciting work that is to come. Let's invest in this community of service-minded readers to expand our impact together. Before you go, please fill out the post-session survey to let us know what you liked and how we can improve. We really appreciate your feedback. I wish you all well and thank you so much for your active participation. Goodbye until next time. Thank you everyone. As Dr. Kang said, it is, it is just a start and we have the link of the work done by our amazing speakers and if you want to get connected please feel free to go and explore thank you everyone for joining thank you so much thank you